Hello to everyone from ubitennis.net. Today profile is Ken Roswell, who just said his 86th birthday. A kid looking through the tennis records from the period between the 50s and the 80s might wonder, was that Roll Roswell always the same person or was it two brothers like the McEnroe's? The most astonishing thing uh, is not the length of the Roswell careers. The first and the last Wimbledon finals played by the little masters, five foot seven tall and six five shoe size were 20 years apart, but rather the quality of his tennis, which on days of top form allowed him to beat anyone, even at 40 years old. This longevity was a result of the technical elegance of his shots. That minute body of his was never under stress. When he was 53, he confessed, I think I will have to do a shoulder surgery, my first injury. Well, nowadays tennis players are already broken at 25. Of course, his weak serve doesn't resemble the 140 mile hour cannonball serve that we see today. However, thanks to the wooden rackets and that surgical backhand of his, all his plays in the most unplayable corners, in the mid 70s, Roswell would easily return serves with speeds of almost 125 miles per hour. Yet another secret for such a long lasting career was possibly Vilma, his very loyal wife whom he met when he was 14. She followed him everywhere with their two kids, just like Mirka does with Roger Federer despite two sets of twins. She has always been behind Ken. Without great uh, domestic harmony, it would have been impossible for Ken Roswell to play for 30 years and win eight Grand Slam singles titles, although he skipped 55 of them because he played for 11 years as a pro. Absolutely amazing. In the past half century, I bumped into Ken Roswell several times, a champion that never put on the attitude of a champion or even that of a famous person. Yes, he, he, he was an idol for a million Australians who knew that in road labor early years as a pro, uh, it was almost all his Roswell to prevail in the head-to-heads. Roswell, however, like Lever, has always been a low profile, sober man, a simple man, humble, accommodating, well mannered. He granted me his last real interview, which by the way was extremely lucid, if you think that he was well above eight years old, a couple of years ago at Wimbledon. However, the last time I talked to him was a year and a half ago on the morning of the Australian Open final when uh, uh, Djokovic beat Nadal. By the way, talking about Djokovic and Nadal, some people may think uh, that with their 56 duels, 21, 28 won by, by Djokovic and 26 by Nadal after the last Roland Garros, nobody had fought more than those two big champions, without considering the epic battles between Martina Navratilov and Chris Everett who played each other 80 times, with Martina leading 43 to 37 wins. Th those people probably do not know that Labour and Roswell played 164 times, with Labour winning 89 and Roswell winning the other 75. None of the old champions could recall how many those matches were. If Roswell had lost to participate to 55 slams because of his 11 years uh, pro career with Jack Kramer, Ron Lever lost uh, in five years 20 majors. Both undoubtedly would have taken more if their lives hadn't been fragmented. In the amateur era before 68, Roswell, four years older than Lever, never played. In the Gypsy Pro Tour, when the pros were on a limbo and couldn't play a major, life wasn't easy. Players who were carrying the canvas court with them, played anywhere, high school gyms, ice rinks, large and small arenas, usually poorly lit. Uh, Labour recalls a night of the bag curfew in Khartoum. We played outdoors, he said, until the swarms of bugs blotted out the lights and that was good night. Roswell and Oda applied a band-aid by pulling their own fans uh, to lure Labour as an attraction into professionalism. 
$150,000 guarantee over three years. We were getting a little old, uh, told me Roswell. We needed new blood. We needed Rod after he had won the four majors in 1962. Well, Roswell won 11 of the first 13 fights and 38 of the first 51 in 1963. Since uh, 64, uh, labor started to take an edge, uh, even if at the end of their pro career, Roswell was up 65 wins to 64, just by one match up. Almost unbelievable. In the open era, labor won versus Roswell 22 times out of 31, but Roswell won the last match in Houston. It was number 164 duel. Roswell won his last tournament when he was 43 years old in Hong Kong. Laver won his last tournament at 37 in Orlando, Florida. As honorary secretary of the Italian International Club, I had been invited to the traditional lunch organized like every year uh, by the Australian International Club in that morning of the men's finals later won by Novak Djokovic versus Rafa Nadal. There were about 100 people between members, uh, relatives, former players, Australian champions. The lunch, with everyone in assigned seats, was held at the South Yarra Tennis Club in Melbourne, a superb and very refined club uh, where the Australian legend Norman Brooks, a three-time Grand Slam champion between nine, uh, 1907 and 1914, was born and raised the first non-British tennis player to win a Wimbledon title. Some fabulous vintage pictures of Brooks dominate several rooms of the huge clubhouse. The seats were assigned in an alphabetical order and it was displayed on a big board. As my surname is Kanagata, by coincidence, I spotted in between Roswell and Sedgman. I couldn't believe it. That was out Kanagata in between two champions who won 13 slams titles altogether. Uh, after lunch, we took a customary picture together. The two of them were, of course, very friendly and happy to recall funny anecdotes about some Italian players, Pietrangeli, Merlo, Sirola, Tacchini. Roswell said about Pietrangeli, Nicky had so much natural talent that if we had all been stuck for months on a desert island without tennis course, and afterwards we had to play a tournament without any training, Nicky certainly would have won it. Sedgman at South Yarra Tennis Club nodded, and I replied, maybe you're right, Ken, but Pietrangeli's opponent in that final would have surely been Ken Roswell. Then Roswell went on telling me a curious story that helps uh, to understand how things have changed in the time between 70 and 50 years ago, let alone nowadays when whoever wins a slam uh, gets uh, $3.5 million. In the mid-50s, after he had lost his first final against uh, Jaroslav Drobny in 1954, to top up his very low wages, Ken used to sell his rackets. They had an image of himself uh, printed on the racket's throat between the shaft and the head. They were called Roswell Sledsinger. He used to sell them to the ball kids, who were almost always children of members of the clubs that organized the tournaments. They were so happy and always dreamed about getting one. I wish Roger Newcomb had sold me one of theirs uh, to me when I was a ball boy during their matches at the Florence Tennis Club in Italy. Although uh, uh, Roswell's rackets cost $35 on the market, he was selling them for five. When Ken won the WCT finals in Dallas, both in 1971 and 72, uh, beating Lever in two memorable finals, the first prize was $50,000. Yeah! <laughs> Roswell recalled, smiling, it took me five years, but the jump from five dollars to fifty thousand was certainly a big uh, <laughs> one. As a comparison, in the early 70s, the US Open first prize, and that was the tournament with the highest uh, prize money, was fifteen thousand dollars. Surely, Roswell, anyway, didn't start playing for money. In his first tournaments, he would have been just happy with a cup of tea, some biscuits, and maybe a lunch. 
uh, can never use to sing, dance, make jokes or be noisy like uh, the old pals Newcomb and Emerson. I think it possibly represents uh, the most stereotypical uh, example of an Australian tennis player in those years, so painstakingly seriously serious that he even uh, used to stay away from the dark rooms of the movie theaters as he was afraid it could potentially damage his visual reflexes. Yet, he was not a servant volley player like the majority of the other kangaroos with a racket, a racket that he often let drop, demoralized by an error that only he would consider silly. When that happened, he would shake his head with a resigned demeanor, but never letting out a shout, let alone a swear word. No one ever heard him saying one. He would never want to make a mistake, give away a point, but he would also never steal a point that he didn't win. The little master was also a big master of fair play.